Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Mac Heads podcast. I took a break last week because of personal life stuff and just needing to catch my breath, but I'm back with a great episode about a couple of things, the upcoming TikTok ban, another vintage record review this time of the miseducation of Lauren Hill, which you guys voted for crazy amounts of times, a quick rundown of the Oscars and what I've been watching on TV and movies. Let's get it started. So the very first thing I want to talk about today is the upcoming possible ban of TikTok. For those of you who are not in the loop, TikTok is one of the biggest apps in the world. I'm pretty sure you guys all know of it. You guys all have different varying opinions. I used to be on TikTok a lot. Like I was actually really on it. I was posting actively. I was on Swift Talk for a hot minute back in 2021. So it's kind of weird to loop back to it three years later. So long story short, the House has signed a bill that will essentially ban TikTok as it exists today. There's many reasons why they said they'd do it. They've been threatening it for years. I think even President, former President Trump tried to ban TikTok. They said that it was out of concern for national security as they believed that ByteDance, the company behind TikTok, which is a Chinese corporation, could hand over millions of people's information over to the Chinese government in the event that ByteDance was subpoenaed by that government. I just want to say it's kind of crazy that there's a lot of problems out in this world. The rising cost of things like I went to the grocery store and my bill exploded by 30%. I mean, like even buying a bag of chips nowadays is more expensive This is what the government is worried about. The government is worried about banning TikTok because they're thinking that there's spies on TikTok, which, you know, like, no offense, not to be like a total hater, but like Facebook, YouTube, and other American corporations have been like mining our data for free to give to advertisers to target us for ads. So I don't understand what's going on with that. I rarely get political, I rarely like to make statements, but I do find it odd that the government is focusing on this rather than stuff that actually matters during an election year. I don't think that TikTok is really a real credible threat. I think that, like, in all honesty, that this is just some sort of dog whistle to distract us from bigger issues. Personal commentary aside, this bill has been passed by the House on bipartisan support. It is headed to the Senate, and if passed, it would force ByteDance to divest and sell the company, or TikTok will just be banned. TikTok is not taking this lying down. They have responded calling this an attack on free speech and that it only has 165 days if this bill is passed to find another buyer, which would apparently be problematic because that is a short amount of time. It's a short amount of time to spin off a company. There's a lot of paperwork involved and additionally getting the new owner up to speed on how to use the platform, how to take advantage of the investment would also be an issue. Joe Biden has already pledged to sign the bill if it reaches his desk, a foolish move, in my honest opinion, if he wants to retain the Gen Z support that he has, which is eroding. TikTok has lobbied Congress and has even done push alerts, which was kind of cringe to creators asking them to call Congress. So what exactly would happen? Apparently, Trump's former Treasury Secretary wanted to set up a group of buyers to buy it. I feel like that would be concerning considering his political alignments, while big players like Google and Microsoft won't because of antitrust laws. Another factor that people are not thinking about is that the Chinese government would have to approve the sale and they said that they won't if it is a forced sale. Oh, and here's the kicker. Here's the kicker for anyone who is thinking of buying TikTok. Apparently, the algorithm would not be sold alongside the app, which would make the app worthless. Like, you're only buying the name. I'm also thinking about who is going to win from this. Like, if TikTok were to be banned in its current state and nothing were to happen, the app were just to be removed or maybe bought by people who don't know how to use it or don't know how to leverage it, who would win? The the winner would be Instagram Reels. It would be Meta, which I personally just don't use because I think it's cringe. I have tried to use Reels for my own content even, and it just does not work for me. And YouTube itself, I guess. So, I mean, like, I guess a bunch of TikTok girlies are going to discover this channel, which is pretty cool. But for me personally, I'm just curious to see if a TikTok ban would change pop music and how pop music works today. As we speak, TikTok has had this immeasurable impact on the way that labels have started to sign artists, how people are discovering music and hits, and how songs themselves are actually being written nowadays. As early as 2019, I've actually seen so many different artists blow up because of the way that people use their sounds, the way that people are exposed to their music. It is this new part of the metagame for being a pop artist that is unavoidable. 
I felt like TikTok was like the first social media platform to really center itself around music in a way that others did not. Because YouTube, discovering music through it is a little bit more clunky and complicated. Like you have to sit through videos. But like with TikTok, you know, you would hear a sound and you'd go, oh, my God, that's a new song that I have to listen to. Also, TikTok has actually really given some players who have been on the edge of breaking out, people like Doja Cat, people like Tate McRae, who have kind of had viral hits here and there. They've given them a place to kind of really show off the process and their work. It's also this platform for fans to really share and showcase niche ideas and expose their artists to the mainstream. So it's kind of a big loss if this app is really banned, you know, it has me concerned, like, is pop music currently a bubble that is formed around this app that's in danger of disappearing? I've seen people who have gone underground, people who have disappeared from the mainstream, resurge because of this app. It is a platform that allows people to really transcend time in the traditional music industry conventions of promo. In a way, it has kind of destroyed the art form of music itself, but it has also rebuilt it into something that's more flexible and possibly more diverse and just more real time. I was going to actually talk about the removal of Universal Music Group's music off TikTok in the podcast that would have happened last week, but I'm going to talk about it now. I felt like that more or less challenged the status quo, seeing the likes of Ariana Grande, Taylor Swift, The Weeknd, and so much more. I believe even artists who have songwriters and publishing under UMG were removed. With so much advertising and promo taking place on TikTok, what would a full ban leave us with? Was the UMG ban a preview of a TikTokless music industry? There are so many artists that have actually come forward, Conan Gray being one of the most noticeable, saying that he wouldn't have a career anymore if TikTok were to essentially be banned. Or is music just not existing on the platform? How would music discovery work? Are we going to return back to radio? Are we going to return back to Spotify's mass playlisting? Would Instagram Reels, which actually does have full access to the UMG library, do anything? What is going to happen? There's so many different possibilities, and while I cannot really go into depth about them until we see them play out in reality, I just wanted to posit these questions to you guys, because the reality is here. TikTok may not be here soon, and the pop industry was built around it. Like, the pop industry that many people enjoy today, I feel like five years after 2019, we've seen the full TikTokification of pop. One thing that I've actually seen a lot of artists, even artists that I love doing right now is teasing the creation of new music, live testing songs by teasing snippets and choruses straight from the studio onto the platform. Like I've been seeing people do that. It's a new way to sort of like see if the music that you're making in real time is clicking with audiences. Some of these songs would actually end up becoming absolutely successful bangers that would go on to become chart staples. Other times we have seen them crescendo into very disappointing full versions that still managed to chart on the Hot 100, so they still work. So kind of back to theorizing what we think might happen. The decision for UMG to take off their music, mainly because of TikTok's poor planning to accommodate the licensing fees and AI rights issues, I feel like UMG pulling out might have actually doomed TikTok because I feel like out of all the industries that could protect TikTok, the music industry should have been the one in the forefront. The UMG deciding to leave the app high and dry has kind of caused it to die. I really think that the government was waiting for the music labels to turn on TikTok. I think that the ban would have been much harder if UMG was lobbying in defense of it. I've also seen a few theories saying that the recent boycotts in protests of the conflict in Gaza being successful might be the reason as to why this ban is actually being pushed as well. For whatever reason, it's very clear that the way that we consume and create music is going to change. Without TikTok, we might actually see a recovery in the craft of songwriting. If you ask me, songs have become shorter and less developed because artists are being pressured to make algorithmically favorable songs. I personally want to see a resurgence in pre-choruses and bridge, which, you know, like, honestly, if TikTok is being banned, this might be the best part of it being banned. 
But at the same time, I do feel like TikTok has actually shown me artists that I've come to really love and was a key factor in the revitalization of many of my older faves, particularly Taylor Swift. I feel like Taylor Swift benefited the most out of many of the legacy artists when it came to TikTok. So it's odd to see UMG leave the app. A quick side note, in the publishing world, where I have a couple of friends who are novelists, I will plug their books eventually, there has been this invisible pressure to conform their work to fit a quote-unquote book talk formula. When I say book talk, I am not saying this with any shade, but it's normally books that are very tropey, feel-good, nothing-burger books that fit the grumpy sunshine paradigm or breezy nothing books that you just, you know, they have their place, like they're a beach read, but they have plagued bookstores everywhere, but also have revitalized the book industry. We, We have to talk about like how commercialism and art don't have to necessarily be in conflict. Even in the film and TV department, I've heard horror stories from creatives like writers and actors that their work has to be quote-unquote shareable. Most recently, the Avatar series on Netflix was literally mid and centered so that it could be cropped to fit vertical social media videos. It's actually a very gray and nuanced discussion on an artistic level. I think that a TikTok ban might actually force people away from catering an algorithm that honestly rewards you being mid just to be the most commercially viable thing possible to most people. But I still sympathize that the platform has become a great tool for people to organize and rally politically to learn things that they would have never learned, even though some of these videos are straight up garbo shitpost. It's very complicated, but can we actually put the genie back in the bottle at this point? I want you guys to sound off in the comments about how you feel about a possible TikTok ban. I know you guys are YouTube girlies, so you guys obviously have a bias maybe against the platform. But what do you guys think about the TikTok ban and how do you think it's going to change art? And it's time for a topic change. This week on my vintage reviews, we're covering The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, the legendary debut album by Lauryn Hill. It remains her only album. I'm just going to chat loosely about the history of the record, things that I found out, the records that it's broken, why it's probably one of the greatest records of all time, arguably the best record to emerge from the 90s. I stand by that. This album established a modernity to music that spans across so many different genres and artists. I feel like it continues to inspire a new generation of artists. I hear her influence everywhere. It is this sprawling, gorgeous mix of singing and rapping done in such an organic, brilliant way that it was revolutionary for its time, and it's still revolutionary today. One artist I feel like really does owe a depth to Lauren Hill and we never talk about it though I think he did sample her so I think he's aware of it was Drake I feel like he owes his career to the popularization of mixing rapping and singing many people actually do cite this as their favorite record of all time including Adele who credits it for inspiring her to have become an artist in the first place Ariana Grande Sweetener itself was directly inspired from a production standpoint according to one of her producers I recall when I was an obsessive fan of Beyonce's For Sue Me, I think it's one of her best records. During the interview process, she actually brought up Lauryn Hill. This album had actually inspired that album's sound. This is one of the most celebrated records of all time. It would go on to collect the coveted Album of the Year trophy, Best R&B Album doo-wop that thing one of the best songs of all time collected best r&b song and best r&b vocal performance and it hit number one on the charts lauren hill even won the best new artist grammy at the 1999 grammys this record would go on to sell 422,000 units which was a then industry high for a female artist And the record would go on to hit Diamond, selling more than 20 million copies. I think it's closer to 25. It remains the highest selling female rapper album of all time. And I don't think we're ever going to see it be passed, especially now with the streaming age. Lauryn Hill had been a member of the Fugees, which was a popular rap group that broke out in 1996 with The Score their second album. It actually had won Best Rap Album and Best R&B Group Vocal for the iconic song Killing Me Softly. The Fugees would disband shortly after that album and Hill would end up in a relationship with Rohan Marley and her pregnancy with him inspired this record. She'd go on to write and produce on every single track of the record. Hill went against the grain. She opted for a 1970s soul-inspired spin. There was a lot of reggae as she had been recording this album in Jamaica. 
There is a very eclectic and fresh sound to it that's somehow cohesive but distinct. I actually feel like the last album to kind of channel that energy recently was SZA's SOS. I feel like this album, though, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, it set the standard for what modern gospel is like today. You can still see the, the you can still hear the reach and influence that she has. I find that the record is ingenious and in that it's framed in a very unique, cool way, starting with a lecture where there's this teacher figure who's calling out names and they call out Lauren Hill a couple of times and she's not present to kind of indicate where she's getting her education from life itself. I also feel like the interludes throughout the entire album with the teacher do indicate that this record is something that you have to listen to in order. The track listing is very deliberate, which I think is a key ingredient to winning that best album of the year trophy at the Grammys. In my honest opinion, I feel like a a purposeful track listing is key. This is a story with a beginning, middle, and end. The next track, Lost Ones, which I honestly think is one of the highlights of the record. It's one of the best breakup anthems, public breakup anthems I've ever heard. It was directed at Wyclef John, who had been a band member of hers with the Fugees, who was talking shit about her, honestly. And she comes back with this very graceful response. The line, my emancipation don't fit your equation, I was on the humble, you on every station, really speaks to that layer of betrayal that Wyclef had pulled on her because he was talking shit about her on the radio. And that refrain of you might win some, but you lost one. That's a devastating way to say like, you're never getting me back again. I always felt like the rapping on this album had a technicality to it, yet a conversational tone to it. The rhymes feel very organic. When you actually read them aloud, it feels more like poetry than actual rap. But then when you hear it in a song, it just works so well. Verse two goes so hard for me. Like every line from every man want to act like he's existing exempt all the way to never want to face it when it's time for punishment. I mean, like the way that she just keeps that rhyme scheme going is insane. I didn't even realize that she was actually sampling Sister Nancy's Bomb Bomb in the track. I didn't know that she was sampling anything, but this entire album is a masterful work that shows off how clever sampling can really make a song really sing without cribbing the entire identity of another song. The hits keep on coming with X Factor. There was a really cute skit right before X Factor where the kids are listing off things about love which I think really is a fun, ironic slant. X Factor is just also just as devastating, but a little bit more upbeat. I really love how honest the verses are. The pre-chorus is so real. Like, tell me who I have to be to get some reciprocity. Like, I I love that idea. It's so honest. It's so real. Like, she's just saying, like, no one's gonna love you more than me, and no one ever will. And this guy's just giving her nothing. One thing about Lauren Hill's music is the chorus doesn't necessarily present itself immediately. Oftentimes, the structure is played fast and loose with the focuses being on the verse so that the storytelling does take precedence. I feel like that's what makes this record so revolutionary. There's not a strict adherence to the songwriting structure, but she clearly understands how to make it work. X Factor samples Can It Be So Simple by the Wu-Tang Clan. Most recently, Nice for What by Drake uses the iconic bridge for his chorus. The breakdown alternating between You Die for Me and Why Won't You Live for Me is immediately crushing. And that guitar solo mid-song coming so left field on my first listen all those years ago. And even now, Hill is just a master at music. This song was about Wyclef being married yet having an affair with her. I can't believe that she aired out his dirty laundry like that. We rarely get songs that confrontational. It's one of the best diss tracks along with the previous track. To Zion with the legendary Carlos Santana is one of the sweetest tracks that I've ever heard on a record. Like this ode to her newborn son is a confessional track. The religious implications, the gospel tone... I felt like the part that really did affect me the most was the way that people in her life were telling her not to risk her career and have this child. It's a very interesting, heavy track about decision making and the divinity of being a mother. We often joke, especially with this channel, 
about mother as a title, but it's a very nuanced conversation between a woman, their child, and society. We rarely get a true dialogue from the mother herself as a storyteller about the decision to bring a child into this world. So the song is very unique. It's a very rarely heard point of view and I feel like that's why this record is so masterful because Hill goes there she goes the extra mile to really expose us to different ways of thinking I do like the skits in between because this one evolves onto what love is through conversation we can't not talk about doo-wop that thing because that is honestly Hill's seminal smash the verses really paint this push and pull between the gender dynamics so well the wordplay the line invoking the Jezebel mythos about how some women are demonized for wanting better, but also reminding women to stand up for themselves and their worth. I really love that line, don't be a hard rock when you're really a gem, because that's a really self-empowering and motivational lyric that rings true. And I do like the fact that she does turn it back towards herself, and she forewarns people that some guys and girls are just after that thing. And that thing is not everything. It's this short-lived sort of materialistic in-the-moment thing that shouldn't necessarily be shamed, but should not be the primary focus of a relationship. I feel like this song actually allocates the blame to men and women pretty equally for failed relationships, where materialism itself leads to issues like broken homes. The second verse itself is a harsh rip on men who run off and leave their lovers high and dry. And can we talk about that production? It is timeless. It sounds just as radio-ready for today as it did in the late 90s. Superstar is a very clever introspection about the balance between art and commercialism. I think that she noticed that the genre that she calls home hip-hop it was becoming extremely popular at that time. I hadn't realized that the song's chorus itself interpolates a song by The Doors, Light My Fire. Actually, someone who was a bit older than me pointed that out to me, and I was like, what? Anyhow, my favorite verse is the third one where she talks about her come up. She talks about how her first album with the Fugees had flopped and then talks about how she worked at a Foot Locker, which is pretty neat. And now she's in a Range Rover. She's on the Walk of Fame, but she wonders how and when they're going to take her down. What's the point of selling out if they're going to sell you out one day is sort of the thesis of the song. Final Hour continues her themes about indicting riches and materialism for living in the moment itself. She really does say that you can get the money or the power, but you need to keep your eyes on the final hour. I really dug that second verse, the way that she cites the Bible. You don't have to be religious to admire the way that she uses the text like citations. Again, the rhyming scheme that she does is just immaculate in the way that she rhymes wine with 1999 to Palestine to bind on verse 3. It flows, it's so effortless, and the production is just very lively. The harps, the trumpets, the saxophone, she really produced and composed this all by herself, and I think that's a feat in its own right. I really do like the duo of tracks when it hurts so bad and I used to love him. Them being sequenced together makes so much sense because the first is sort of this deliberation about a relationship. You can hear the pain in her voice and the lack of overall resolution. That final chorus always floors me, but I used to love him with Mary J. Blige is confirmation that that relationship is over. Blige jumps on the track so effortlessly, like the line, addicted to love like the drug of a fiend, that's a cold-ass line. It's a mother-off between these two, and the real winner is the listener. Forget Them Father takes us back to the more allegorical and biblical lyricism that Hill employs on this record. On this track, she interpolates her then-partner's father's track, Concrete Jungle. The second verse is a master class in rapping, seeing her switch from her gospel vocals to just tearing it up. It really feels like there's a whole nother artist that has just jumped on the track, but it's actually just Hill herself. She can sing, but when she raps, it feels like she's her own feature sometimes, and that's a very rare ability that only like a once in a generation artist can pull off effortlessly one of my personal favorite deep cuts is every ghetto every city where she just talks about growing up in south jersey it's a very picturesque recreation homage to the sights and sounds that raised her and made her who she is today the refrain where she detours and she sings between her verses about what she ate and what she did it's not just nostalgic it's objective like a snapshot the good and the bad of growing up in that area i feel like on a album level it's world building on a personal level it's just autobiographical i feel like personal music really does 
hit harder than songs that tend to be about more generic subjects that do apply to everybody. But I feel like being able to be vulnerable and to share your point of view and take that risk and sacrifice universality for real empathy and being able to just show who you are, that's what Hill does best on this record. Nothing Even Matters for D'Angelo is the slow jam tender love song that's dedicated to how love itself can give her these feelings of being drunk without actually being drunk because nothing even matters. The way that she and D'Angelo trade verses really to describe this love serves as a sharp contrast to her more jaded earlier tracks because she's found this love and she's showing it. I feel like oftentimes when an artist chooses to contradict their earlier statements, it's to showcase a level of understanding and a versatility to the artist, not just in their craft, but in the emotions that they're able to elicit. Everything is Everything is a positivity anthem about overcoming adversity in the inner city. The piano on the track was actually played by a then-unknown John Legend. I was shocked that this wasn't a bigger hit at the time because it's a very catchy, upbeat track. It's very inspirational, the way that the production works around a loop, metaphorically speaking to the way that the struggle will always be there, but so will this chance to change. I feel like even on a production level, Hill is telling a story. The final track is the title track, and it speaks to the thesis statement of the work in whole. It's an encapsulation that the answer that she was looking for was always in herself, that she has seen the light and she can define her own destiny. She was absent in the skits because she was out there living life and learning and finding herself. She was not in the classroom doing these discussions, even though the discussions ironically tie to what she's singing about. Lauren Hill's education was straying away from the light and making art and living her life and going through the dark times in order to really share what she's learned. Even on an unintentional level, I felt like it always harkens back to Plato's The Cave as an allegory. Hill is someone who has gone through the cave and seen the light. And of course, I need to talk about the two hidden tracks because one of them is a brilliant recreation of Can't Take My Eyes Off You by The Four Seasons. Her cover is so fresh and rebuilt from the ground up. It almost feels like a whole new song. And the way that she sings in the chorus with the passion, just warmth bottled up into a recording. The final, final track, Tell Him, is this ode to a lover, or perhaps Jesus himself, which really does continue into the scripture referencing. I feel like the biblical references are part of the DNA. It's a really nice footnote to end on because it concludes this discussion about love and devotion, which seems to be the answers to the questions at times. Lauren Hill's guiding light is the love that she has for her people, for her community, for her loved ones, and for herself. It goes without saying that this is one of those 10 out of 10 records. I think that it is one of those inimitable records that still managed to move the needle. Hill never got around to making a proper follow-up due to her anxieties about fame, legal troubles that would come down the way, and wanting to only make work that she felt was worthy or reasonable. But in terms of being a one-and-done artist, this remains one of the greatest works of all time. And honestly, I really do hope that we live to see a day that Hill feels comfortable enough to tell us about what she's learned so far. The door is always open, and I'm curious to see that if we will see in our lifetimes a continuation of her records. Before I talk about movies and other stuff that I watched, including the Oscars, I need to shout out Van Wilden, who is one of my favorite Ariana Mutuals on Twitter. I love you so much. Thank you for asking for a shout out. You got your cameo. Also, everyone needs to follow my longtime mutual, Jay Miller, who is now on YouTube. He does these brilliant reaction videos. I think he's smart, insightful. He did my thumbnails for my 2020 Gaga series back when I was starting to do video essays for real. And he's genuinely one of the funniest people that I know. So go watch his videos. And now we're going to talk very briefly about the Oscars. I went into that night relatively optimistic. I actually had a list of predictions. I ended up missing five. So I think I got 18 out of the 23 categories. That Oscar night followed the BAFTAs nearly beat for beat. I think out of all of the misses that I had in my predictions, the one that hurt me the most and the big elephant in the room that we have to talk about is the best actress race. For many, the race seemed just about done prior to the Oscars, aside from Lily Gladstone's win at SAG. It seemed pretty apparent that Emma Stone was going to win for her brilliant performance as Bella Baxter in Poor Things. 
I love Poor Things as a movie. I thought that was really fascinating. I've seen it like maybe four times. And I have to admit that Emma Stone is undeniably amazing in that role. But I'm a bigger fan of Flowers of the Killer Moon. I really adored Lily Gladstone's performance in that, even though I do think that part of why she didn't win was because the story was not focused around her character of Molly. Instead, the movie really hinges around Leonardo DiCaprio's performance, which wasn't even nominated because I don't think they campaigned him correctly. Oscars aren't really reflective of the quality of the movies. I feel like the race to win an Oscar is more of a marketing tool rather than an objective measurement of how good a movie is. That being said, there is a strategy behind campaigning for Oscars. I have a couple of friends who worked on the team for Poor Things, which led them to winning four of their nominations. There's a lot of rubbing elbows. There's a lot of events. I live in LA, so I actually have the chance to attend some of these campaigning events, and they go full out. They show the movie. They bring out the people who did the costumes, the production design, etc., whatever category you're up for, and they have these very curated, intimate sort of Q&As where they really talk about their process. There's almost like a science to them, and the Oscars have never been the same since the 90s when he who shall not be named and Miramax essentially turned it into a money pit. Being nominated enough actually does mean a lot. It does boost your career. It leads you to getting roles, but winning it itself actually also does guarantee like the bigger stuff. In some cases, I recall in the early 2010s, it was, if you did win an Oscar, you would eventually get a Marvel movie. That no longer seems to be the case. If anything, you're taking a Marvel movie now because you need the paycheck. But I digress. Being an Oscar winner and a nominee or just being recognized by the Academy itself is an honor. Winning the trophy itself would have meant a lot to Gladstone as she would have been the first native actress to win. I do think that eventually she will win an Oscar very soon. She has a bunch of projects in development. I felt like Emma Stone didn't necessarily need to win this Oscar. Her winning it really doesn't really move the needle too far for her as she's already a successful producer and actress in her own right. Obviously, Oppenheimer went on to win most, if not all, of the awards that night. So many of my friends who aren't film people were shocked to find out that Christopher Nolan himself had been nominated so many times, but he'd never actually won the Oscar himself. And I feel like that fact alone speaks to how long it can take to win or get recognition despite being known as, like, the guy. Christopher Nolan, for many young auteurs and many young fans, he is the guy. Killian Murphy for the longest time went unrecognized and he has been in the industry for 20 plus years. So again, winning an Oscar doesn't really like speak to your quality as an actor or anything, but it is just a fascinating marketing tool. Of all of the misses that I got, I actually lost two categories because I bet against poor things. I actually had voted for Barbie in both of those categories and I believe that was best makeup and best costuming. I also made a big miss in best animated feature. I should have gone with The Boy and the Heron, which I enjoyed more than Across the Spider-Verse, which honestly was a pretty good movie, but like kind of forgettable compared to the first Spider-Verse, which was an Oscar darling. Best Supporting Actress went to Divine, Joy Randolph, for The Holdovers, which is a movie that really is near and dear to my heart. I highly recommend that you guys see that movie. It's a really sweet film. Robert Downey Jr. seemed to really be pissed off with Jimmy Kimmel, who did not do that good of a job hosting. I feel like he should not host the Oscars again. I'd sooner see John Mulaney, who I personally dislike myself. I'm not a fan of him at all. I feel like he's still a better... Honestly, anyone would be a better host than Jimmy Kimmel, who he just really doesn't have the charisma required to carry the show. I know that he is the host probably because ABC carries the Oscars, but that's like a no-go for me. As for next year, who I think is going to win, I think Dune Part 2 is taking it. I'm not going to say that it's guaranteed to win, but I think out of all of the studio pictures, it has the best chance, even though it was released way too early. I don't see Timothy Chalamet winning Best Actor. I see him winning Best Actor one day. But Denis Villeneuve, like, he is going to win Best Director, if not next year, a following year. 
Yorgos, who directed Poor Things, is going to release his next collaboration with Emma Stone this year, but it's an anthology, so I don't think that's going to fare well with the critics. I do think that, like, there's going to be good performances in the film, but, like, because it's an anthology, because it seems to be a bunch of short films put into one film, they're all going to be supporting actor-actresses. A close friend of mine asked me if Challengers was going to be a challenger for the Oscars. I'm not quite sure. I could see Zendaya possibly sneaking into Best Actress, but the film itself is... I'm just going to say there's a reason why it's being put to April, which is not a competitive sort of date for the Oscars, though there have been exceptions. Like, Everything Everywhere completely won despite being released in March. So the rules don't really apply, but like just by logic... And from the version of the script that I read, I don't think that it's going to be as shocking or as crazy as some people think it's going to be, but everyone in the movie is hot, so, I mean, like, knock yourself out. As for what I've watched this week, I watched Young Royals Season 3. I've seen the finale, I stayed up, and I saw the finale, I was watching it on my phone. It came out today, the day that I'm posting this, I'm not going to spoil it, but I am going to say that this season was a complete wild crapshoot. I did not expect it to be as dramatic or tumultuous as it was. I had a lot of fun watching the performances. Everyone is great as always, but I just felt like the writing was not reflected very well upon the trailer. I felt like the trailer set us up for a completely different looking season. I also watched about half of Lindsay Lohan's AI movie. People are saying that it was written by AI. I think that it's just a very clumsy generic rom-com. It's called Irish Wish. It was released for St. Patrick's Day. As a movie, it just did not work for me. I felt like it was very boring. I felt like the contrivances were a little too similar to 27 Dresses and a bunch of other rom-coms that are so much better. I ended up watching 27 Dresses instead. 27 Dresses is like one of the most like horrific movies that I've ever seen in my life. This poor girl, like, her sister is a Judas. She steals her man, who is extremely boring. And then Satan incarnate himself, James Marsden, like, swoops in and just makes life a living hell for her. It's about this girl who's been, like, she's always the bridesmaid, but never the bride. And she's been in 27 different weddings, has the seven, 27 different dresses. Some, most of you have seen this movie. So I I actually referenced it in my Midnight's review two years ago, which is kind of crazy. I actually walked to the theater. My theater is about 30 minutes away from where I'm living right now. And I went to go see the American Society of Magical Negroes, which felt like a very long SNL skit. It's not as bad as some people said it was going to be, but it's not as charming or as good. It's very low stakes. Justice Smith is such a good actor. He deserves better. I also saw this movie called Snack Shack, which was this kind of like 1991 throwbacky movie starring the kid from the Fablemans who's really cute in this movie. He's absolutely adorable. He plays like a Ferris Bueller S type, but it's focused on this other guy who's about to be sent to military school. And of course, I was watching the Eras Tour Taylor's version on Disney+, Plus, which is three and a half hours. I might make a video about it, ranking each era. I was watching it with the people that I'm living with right now. They needed to take an intermission halfway through because it's a very long concert and I don't blame them at all. Oh, and I saw the new Kung Fu Panda 4 movie, which I cannot talk about completely unbiased for reasons I can't talk about, but it was a very cute movie, and Aquafina was adorable as a little fox, and it may not be as good as the first three Kung Fu Panda movies, but it's pretty passable, it's well done. I felt like Viola Davis's villain was a little bit weaker than, like, advertised but overall it's just fun to be able to see the characters again dreamworks really needs to get their stuff together i heard that they laid off about half their staff this past week just because they canceled some bollywood movie i don't have all the tea i do know that cartoon brew which is a website that i frequent because i love animation said that they laid off half of their staff and they are planning to outsource much of their animation to other countries. 
Which is kind of unfortunate because DreamWorks had always been known for making most of its assets and its like sort of animation in the States, particularly in Glendale, which was the city that I used to live in. Do not stalk me. I also saw Love Lies Bleeding. I cannot talk at full length about that movie because I think YouTube would flag me for talking about some pretty graphic stuff. But it's a really solid film. I didn't really love it. I wanted to love it more. Kristen Stewart is brilliant in it. I felt like Ed Harris is also really good in it. I just did not like the script. It felt pretty random at times. And there was a lot of shock value in it. Not like Saltburn, which was just all shock value, but like none of the actual like meaning behind it. I felt like the romance between the leads and Love Lies Bleeding was really well done. Just really violent and gory, though. Just a heads up. Do not go in there expecting it to be some cute kind of movie about two women committing crimes. I mean, like, it is really, like, it's kind of, like, Bound. I really thought of Bound, but, like, a modern version of it, but, like, with bodybuilders. But also without the Wachowski sort of, like, weirdness to it. Because I feel like the Wachowskis always bring, like, weird energy to the movies that they make. They made The Matrix, which is re-releasing in theaters this week for its 25th anniversary. Can you believe it's 25 years old? Also, fun fact, five years ago when it had its 20th anniversary, I went on a date with a guy to go see that one. Isn't that crazy? That was five years ago. Another movie that I saw, I think, was Ricky Stenicki, which kind of disappointed me. John Cena was funny in it. He got to wear like a Britney Spears outfit. He looked pretty good in it. Oh, and I saw a movie with a friend at the Egyptian theater. Hi, friend, if you listen to this podcast, which I highly doubt you do. It was this like sleazy 1982 movie called Vice Squad that takes place in LA. And there was a Q&A with the actors from the movie, and they could not recognize the streets. It's about hookers and pimps. It's like this really insane movie. I was cringing throughout all of it. My friend enjoyed it way more than I did. I had a good time. It was fun. The Egyptian is the theater that I frequent in LA. I've been there like about three times. And it's this really gorgeous old-timey one that's been restored. Oh, when I rewatched Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind for the Ariana review, which I am so proud of. I had so much fun recapping that. I did want to make a video about the slightly deluxe version of Ariana's album, but it kind of came and went because I got swept up with like the last week, which honestly like a lot happened in the last week. For those of you who are script writing nerds, like people who write scripts, a script that I wrote ended up getting an eight on the blacklist, which is this website that's like a big deal to like screenwriters. So it was kind of insane and validating. I had written the script maybe like a year and a half ago, and I've been kind of like revisiting and re-editing it. And then I submitted it like two weeks ago for some initiative for diversity stuff. And it ended up getting a pretty good review, which is a big deal. And I felt really good about that. And honestly, this podcast has been so successful. Like, it has exceeded my wildest dreams. I only thought that a hundred of you guys were going to tune in. But I'm grateful to be a part of your commute or a part of your day. If you're only here for one section, I have timestamps as always. I just really enjoy doing these podcasts. And I'm, I think I'm just going to wrap it here because I'm like recording this at three in the morning out of the fact that, like, it's the most quiet time to record. But I just want to give a quick shout out to all of my loyal members for the channel. Thank you so much for directly supporting my channel by having hit that join button and being a member. You mean so much to me. And thank you to my subscribers. Thank you guys for just taking time out of your day to hit that subscribe button, hit that notification bell to kind of stay up to date with my content. I'm so grateful to have a base of people who will just ride and die for me no matter what sort of thing I cover. And I that means a lot to me because I cover such a wide variety of different subjects. I started this channel just in pop and I started to explore different genres like country and rap. And it's been so much fun just covering music. And I might actually start covering like TV shows and movies. I think that this podcast has been a really fun launching pad to see what you guys are interested in. Let me know below what you want me to cover. I will be talking about Loose for the next vintage record just because it got so many votes. And then I will put another poll up to decide what will be the one after that. The Sweet Escape and All Right Still will be on that. 
I believe. Thank you so much for your time, and I will see you on the next episode of the Mac Heads podcast. Have a lovely day.